Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Hello, we are so glad they're listening today and we are looking forward to talking to you. This is a gardening show about what you want to talk about. So if you got questions about lawns, gardens, uh, trees, shrubs, houseplants, whatever you want to discuss, uh, all is fair game. So we'll, we'll go ahead and give you our phone number so you can write it down and give us a call at 845-5689, 845-5689. Or you can reach me by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess, one word, at tamu. Dot edu. And we are looking forward today to talking about all kinds of things spring. I hope that uh, you are uh, for at least this one hour inside and uh, talking gardening with us as, as opposed to being outside in this wonderful weather actually doing gardening. There's plenty of time for that coming up. Uh, so we're going to talk about all kinds of different things today, including the things that you are interested in. Uh, I want to start off and uh, mention a few things that are going on around town. This is uh, uh, an active time of the year for gardening kinds of activities. And so uh, we're really wanting to kind of get the word out so you are aware of them. By the way, if you, if you want to know about gardening activities, you can go to the Master Gardener website, which is brazosmg.com. And there is a calendar there for things going on around the area. Uh, pretty much the things you hear me talk about on this show as we make local announcements and maybe even more uh, that you want to definitely get on your calendar. For example, on Tuesday, March 22nd, next Tuesday, the Texas A&M Women's Garden Club Interest Group, or excuse me, Garden Interest Group, uh, the GIG, G-I-G, good name for something that's Aggie, uh, at 11.30 to 1.30, Charla Anthony, a professional horticulturist here in the Brazos Valley who used to be with us at the Extension Office, will be presenting Made in the Shade, Plants That Don't Sunbathe, <laughs> common and not so common plants for shady spots in our landscapes. If you live in a part of town where uh, the trees have gotten larger and what used to be nice and sunny now is becoming nice and shady, well, it's certainly nice to have shade when the temperature heats up outside, but goodness, when we're looking for places for plants, usually we want quite a bit of sun, especially for things that flower. But there are a lot of plants that don't need full sun, or at least uh, not... Um, uh, or can survive or even thrive in, in less sun. So uh, Charlotte will be talking about plants that uh, are made for the shade or made in the shade that can really do well. Now that's at Peace Lutheran Church Fellowship Hall on, on Rio Grande Boulevard where it joins uh, with Harvey Mitchell Parkway there. Uh, and it's free, so 11.30 to 1.30. Go hear Sharla. Sharla is an excellent horticulturist, very, very adept public speaker, too. I think you'll thoroughly enjoy the program. In fact, I know you will. Uh, so I encourage you to take part in that Tuesday, March 22nd. Now, there is also uh, this Saturday, uh, day after tomorrow, and Sunday, uh, March 19th and 20th, at Boonville Heritage Park up in Bryan from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., 
Uh, they are going to be celebrating the first days of spring at Boonville Heritage Park. You can come and identify wildflowers. You can create a masterpiece at the museum's watercolor station. Oh, that'll be fun. And pick up a free activity packet with a scavenger hunt, local wildflower ID guide, and more. So it's a good opportunity not just for adults but kids as well. Uh, to come and enjoy uh, the beautiful wildflowers that are starting to bloom because we are about to begin the big parade of wildflowers that carries us on into summer. You'll also get to learn about local history and explore the park. Uh, you uh, Visitors that are ages 5 and up are required to wear face masks at all times. And the details, you can go to the Museum of Natural History. That's BrazosValleyMuseum.org, the Museum of Natural History, Saturday the 19th and Sunday the 20th from 10 to 4. Also on Sunday the 20th, uh, the Master Gardeners and AgriLife Extension Office are having a Get Growing series talk out at Lick Creek Nature Center on Rock Prairie Road, far out to the east of town. You're going to learn about all kinds of things related to soil. Dr. Sam Feigley, a retired soil scientist here with AgriLife Extension, is, a, is our speaker, and he's going to be talking about soil and improvements. And if you've not lived here long, uh, sometimes for folks, the soil is a rude awakening in this area. Uh, we have all kinds of soil in different parts of the county in the area, but a lot of it is just a heavy clay, and it's hard to deal with. It doesn't drain well. It's, it's tight. It, uh, the oxygen levels down in the soil that the roots want are not are going to go very deep because of that tight clay, but there's a lot you can do to improve it. Uh, not only the texture, and, or excuse me, the structure of it, but also the nutrient content. How do you take a soil sample? How do you read a soil sample? What kind of nutrients do you need? Well, Dr. Feigley uh, is an excellent lecturer, uh, is, and uh, he is also a Brazos, a Brazos County Master Gardener on top of it all. He's going to be out at Lick Creek Park on Sunday, March 20th from 3 to 4.30 p.m., the Lick Creek Nature Center. Uh, talking about soil. Now, there's a $4 fee for attending that, uh, as well as other kinds of programs that they have out at Lick Creek. Uh, and if you're interested in more information, just go uh, to the uh, Parks Department uh, at uh, City of College Station. You can find out more about that. But I would say before you even consider putting a plant in the ground, you need to have your soil at its optimum condition. So this would probably be the first lecture you should attend uh, to learn how to get that soil right. Because when you do, then all that you try to grow uh, will turn out much more successful. If you start with poor soil conditions, all of the fertilizers and snake oils and everything else you can think of to put on that plant or that soil is just not going to cut it. Uh, but getting the soil right to begin with is critical. So I encourage you uh, to take part in that activity. By the way, our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardens, uh, success, garden success at tamu dot edu. On Sunday, March 27th, this is a little further out, but I just want you to get on your calendar. The um, uh, Monarch March uh, will occur out at Lick Creek Park at their Monarch Way Station. There'll be educational booths, tips on how to create your own Monarch Way Station or Butterfly Garden, and, and much, much more. This is Sunday, March 27th from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, you can learn all about it again. Go to the College Station Parks website for more information. This event is free. And uh, speaking of free, another thing that you really ought to be doing, not just once, but more than once through the course of this spring, is visiting the gardens on campus at Texas A&M. The gardens out on West Campus near the Ag and Life Sciences Building uh, are just absolutely beautiful. And they, they change as we go through the season, so there's always something new to see out there. There's stuff that the kids can do and learn. Uh, and there's everything from, from turf grass to uh, grape vineyards to fruit orchards to herb gardens, roses, perennials, uh, and on and on. 
out there. And it, I just would really encourage you to visit the Gardens at Am. It's a wonderful spot. Uh, you can take the kids and enjoy a walk through the gardens. And um, it's, uh, again, a free event, a free thing to go and to do. On the weekends, I understand that there's some parking uh, that's not so available during the week and some of the lots out that way. And so that Saturday, Sunday, be good times to go out and visit uh, the gardens. Uh, a couple of other things going on. Uh, we got some plant sales coming up. So tomorrow and Saturday, the 18th and 19th, the 27th annual Pioneer Herb, uh, Pioneer Unit Herb and Plant Sale. It's called Voila Violets. Interesting name. Uh, it's at Festival Institute out at Round Top, and it's from 9 to 5 p.m. That's Friday and Saturday, so don't wait for the weekend, Friday and Saturday. Uh, it's open to the public. There will be presentations on Sunday. They do require reservations for those, uh, or registration, excuse me, for that. And it's $45 for that, and you can go to herbsocietypioneer.org. One word, herbsocietypioneer.org to find out more about that. That's a wonderful visit out there, too, to the Festival Institute at Round Top. Uh, boy, we've got a lot of things going on. I told you there was. It's spring. So on Saturday, the 19th, the Budding Out Plant Sale and Festival at the John Ferry Garden. Now, this is out in Hempstead. Uh, and if you want more information, uh, I, I would go to jfgarden.org. jfgarden.org, as in John Ferry Garden.org. Uh, and uh, it's open to the general public. Uh, the members are able to get in at 9 a.m. By the way, you can join and be part of that public garden. Uh, uh, and you can also, if you're just from the general public, available uh, for entry at 10 a.m. They're going to have rare plants that are desirable uh, to really discerning plant collectors. A lot of unique offerings. Uh, it's not just uh, the gardens themselves that are that are offering plants for sale, but they have a number of vendors that are going to be offering all kinds of things. I mean, we're talking about herbs and ferns. Uh, we're talking about rare tropicals and bulbs, uh, tropicals that do well uh, in this area or some that maybe you protect during the winter, but they're still very well worth, worth uh, having. Uh, lots of trees available, uh, just all kinds of unusual plants. You know, like the Venus flytrap or sundews and other insect-eating carnivorous plants. Boy, is that ever way cool? You know, throw a housefly in there and watch them go to town. Uh, there's lots of good, good uh, different uh, nurseries and, and groups that are offering plants. There'll be artists there uh, that have their wares and other vendors uh, out at this event. So I would really encourage you to definitely give this a shot. I think you will enjoy visiting the John Ferry Garden and we'll find that uh, it is well worth uh, your time to go out. And again, that's Saturday, day after tomorrow, March 19th, and it's out in Hempstead. But to get the specifics, this begins at 10 a.m. for general public. Go to John, or excuse me, jfgarden.org, jfgarden.org. Well, let's take a pause there and go to the phones. Uh, our phone number is 845-5689 or by email garden success at tamu.edu. Hello, Syed. How are you today? Yep, I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm go How can you not be good on a spring day like this, right? <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. I'm looking through a window and there's a little bit of breeze and the grass is just get, starting to get greener. And yes. Hot, but a couple of uh, bird feeders, and they're full of birds right now and eating. And I think everything is just uh, like the spring supposed to be. That's right. That's uh, right. Well, what you got going on today? Actually, my question, uh, uh, Tip, about uh, the time to fertilize. I've got uh, some uh, uh, roses in, in pots, and then we have got some flower beds in which we have got uh, um, dwarf uh, yopan and uh, flambego. Uh, will be coming later, I guess, and uh, and then uh, and I've got miscellaneous things. So I have got in front of me this uh, uh, Miracle Grow Liquor Feed. Uh, yes. Is it okay to use it at this time, or wait, or what? So those types of liquid feed are good for getting nutrients 
fast, in fact, immediately to the root system to be available. Uh, I, I will use them when I'm putting out new transplants to give them a good head start. Those little roots need to get going. They need plenty of nutrition uh, as that plant gets established. I generally don't consider those something that you use uh, long term, like every time you fertilize a plant. Uh, you could, but it's a more expensive way to fertilize. And uh, so right. generally we use the liquid feeds as a supplement, with the exception being plants that are in containers, uh, have a very limited root system. Uh, so those you can continue to do liquid feed or you can, you can uh, some, a lot of times I'll use a slow release fertilizer in the container and then just the liquid feed as a supplement to get them going. And maybe if they need a quick boost later, uh, that's a quick way to do it. So just want to follow the label real carefully and don't overdo it. Uh, just, uh, yeah, don't I, I have I have burnt uh, some of these plants by overusing it in the past, so I'll be careful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you know how we are. I mean, people think, well, if if one is good, then two is better, right? And so we end up, uh, or as we say in gardening, if a teaspoon's good, a tablespoon's better. Well, that is not true. Uh, and, Correct, uh, yes. Yeah. 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 So this osmocote is okay at this time or not? Yes, osmocote is a slow release, and there are many slow releases, both organic and synthetic, uh, and that you can, you almost can't burn with those because the the nutrients are released gradually over time. Now you certainly could overuse them, but um, they're they're a, I'll, I guess I'll say safer in the sense of uh, operator error isn't so much of a concern. And so people will mix them in uh, to the soil before planting. So they will put some in a pot before planting as well into the growing mix. Uh, and so that that's fine. Those will feed over about a three to four month period, uh, depending a lot on temperature and soil moisture content. Okay. Okay. And uh, for lawn, we have to wait, isn't it? A trip, um, fertilizing lawn should be around May or something like uh, that. That's right? Yeah. It, well, actually, it's about... I'll say early to mid-April, but the real answer is the second time you mow the lawn. Uh, so okay. we could have a cold spring that the lawns just wake up really slowly and get moving, or we could have one where they're they're hitting the ground running in mid-March. And so uh, you just want to, uh, when you've mowed the lawn twice, that means it's really growing now. That's a good time to fertilize your lawn. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that's... Uh that's good. I, I got my answers. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful day and we'll be speaking to you in, in, in the next week or two. All right, good. We look forward to that and you have a wonderful weekend out in the garden. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Uh, let's see our phone number, 845-5689 and now we're going to talk to Wayne. Hello, Wayne. Good afternoon. Afternoon. I, I have a, was given a, a small live oak tree in a pot and um, a friend of mine gave it to me, and I, and, uh, I fear they, they dug it up without its complete root ball. I, it, was, it was a beautiful little tree um, in the pot. Before, within a week, all the leaves on it uh, turned brown. Mm. And, and while there's still some green when they scratch on the trunk, I really don't know whether it's, I can save it or, or whether I can cut it way back or if it's just a mm -hmm. hopeless case. Well, that's a that's a call. I just am going to have a hard time making, uh, Wayne. I I can tell you this: that a live oak should not turn brown in a week, and that indicates a major root problem, especially at a time of year like we've been in, where the demands are so low on the plant because mm -hmm. it's relatively cool. Um, uh, that is very concerning, and I I don't know what would cause that other than a massive root loss. Okay, yeah. that's what I feared. Yeah. So it's, it's you could probably you, wasting my time to. Well, you know it, it. You know if it's a show tree, a prize tree in the yard, I would pull it and put a new one in probably. Uh, if it if it's just there out somewhere and you know you, you have time, you can give it a little shot. You can wait and see what it's going to do. Uh, I guess there's a chance that I'm wrong and it'll pop out new growth and keep going because the roots really are okay, uh, but. In most cases, it's probably going to be a very slow recovery, if indeed it recovers at all. Okay. All right. Well, the doctor has spoken. Thank you oh very my. much. Oh, my. Thanks for the honorary doctorate, by the way. I appreciate it. I all right. appreciate it. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Wow. All right. Let's see our number, 
5689 or by email garden success at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh, let's see we we're talking about sales and things going on the pioneer unit herb and plant sale on tomorrow and saturday uh, out at round top and the uh, sale and festival at John Ferry Garden. And by the way, this isn't just a plant sale. There's a lot going on there from art and other things. Uh, and that's on Saturday, March 19th. Uh, I just want to give you kind of a, a head, couple of head starts. On the 26th, next Saturday, a week from this Saturday, the Brazos County Master Gardeners are having their spring plant sale. And it begins at 8 a.m. at the County Extension Office, the Brazos County Extension Office, which is out next to the tax office, if those of you are familiar with that. There will be natives, perennial shrubs, herbs, vegetables, bulbs suited for Brazos County growing conditions. The Master Gardeners have really uh, accumulated a wonderful collection of some things out there. So you'll want to make sure and take part in that. Just a word of warning, and this is a good plant sale word of warning in general. Uh, the best things often go fast uh, because people that know what they're looking for, it's kind of like a garage sale. Have you ever noticed that? You get to a garage sale about four hours after it starts and everything you're looking for, it's like, yeah, we had one, we sold it. Um, and so uh, getting out around eight is a good idea for those. Have your wagon or whatever so you can pull it around and, and get, uh, get the plants that you're looking for. On Saturday, April 2nd, the Lions Extension Club annual spring plant sale will be occurring as well, and that's out in Somerville. Uh, it'll be 8.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. They're going to have all kinds of plants, including pass-along plants, yard art, and bake sale items. Uh, that sounds like a lot of fun, too. So that's the next Saturday, April the 2nd, out there. So spring is a time for all kinds of plant sales. By the way, our nurseries and garden centers are loading up with a lot of things. Uh, we're still feeling the effects of, uh, you know, the the uh, distribution delays that uh, COVID, I guess, originally brought on us. Uh, and so it's a challenge. But I was at um, a couple of garden centers the other day uh, just walking around looking at what was going on. And uh, they are really, really working to get in plants and they have a wonderful selection. So don't think that, that they're not finding a way to get in all kinds of things. But they often come in in smaller quantities than they used to uh, because the growers, the producers, the sellers are having to divvy it out a little bit, give some to this garden center, some to that, uh, as they cover a wider area of the state. And so if you're interested in something, you need to get out and get it. Don't, don't delay because somebody else is going to come snatch it up. And this is the great time to be out and doing all that kind of planting. Well, let's see. Let's go back to the phones, 845 Five six eight nine and talk to John. Hello, John. Good morning. Uh, on the Master Gardener plant sale, do they do they have vegetable starts there as well as the flowers and whatnot? Oh yes, they do. They sure do. In they fact, they. I was looking at the list of tomatoes that they have, and John, there's tomatoes you've not even grown or heard of before. <laughs> There's some I've never grown or heard of before on here as well, uh, as well as some old, old, definite, proven. You can't go wrong varieties too. I'll be darned. Well, uh, I'm in particular looking for some collard starts. I had some and I managed to kill them with the cold weather. You know, I don't know if if they have collards or not. Uh, I haven't seen that list. Um, we could find out, and I could I can let you know maybe next week when we when we do this again, or you can call the extension office. We can find out and get you a, an answer to that. Uh, do you think the the list is online yet? Another good question that I should know the answer to, but I don't know. The the challenge every year, and especially now uh, with what I was talking about in terms of availability of things, it's it's hard to say what we're going to have when day to day things are changing, uh, and so it it makes it hard to put that list online. Uh, because it it could be misleading, you know. Someone thinks, oh, they don't have this, and turns out we do. Uh, so I would, uh, I would, I would just send me an email or call the office and let's let's get specific answers you, to what what you've got going. Do you recall right offhand what the Master Gardener's website is? Yes, I do. It's brazosmg.com. Okay. Brazosmg. Well, In fact, while I'm, I, I, if I can do two things at once, which is one of the <laughs> most huge ifs in the world, uh, I'm going to go to that website. 
um, and see, you know, see if I can get an answer to to your question. I, I should be able to answer that. And that's not this weekend, but the following weekend. The following Saturday, but it starts at 8 a.m. So don't don't mess around if you want something unusual. You know, they've got a they've got a the sun sugar, which is a cherry, golden yellow. Oh, sweet as all get out. Um, uh, cherry tomato indeterminate one and and then of course the early girl and the celebrity those that we just you know absolutely can't go wrong with and and they even have one uh if if you haven't seen a a berkeley tie-dye tomato you you need to go see it uh if if you can just imagine what a tie-dye colored tomato might look like that's pretty much what we're dealing with here they've got one of those in fact i'm gonna have to get one just to see what it what it uh what it does but people like the strange and new and weird stuff now don't they yeah i i really like the the little the little sweet tomatoes my only problem is the space and and those indeterminates are yes they they get away from they are enthusiastic growers uh so and they kind of take more than their share yeah they can they sure can they're really good too. Uh, they, they are very good yeah there's juliet's another one i like to grow and it's a it's a large grape uh they'll have that one but it it does also uh tend to vine there are some new i'm trying out some new uh not vining uh tomatoes that are cherries and grape types uh this year that, of course, they're they're not available anywhere other than by seed, and so uh, we're trying a couple of them out to see whether they're going to be worth having or not. On the indeterminate tomatoes, can 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 you prune those back? Do they is that kill yes. them? Yes, you can do you can do two things. You can prune them. You can prune them and have the side shoots take off and and grow from lower. Uh, or you can uh, just let them go to the ground and then go back up again. That's what I often do when I have a, a little trellis fence for them to grow on. Uh, I just let them go to the top and then go back to the ground. In a greenhouse, what they do is grow them on a on a, uh, uh, a cord, a, you know, a twine, and they just lower the twine as it grows. So as that vine's growing up, the twine's getting longer, and so you've always got your harvest about at you know the height you want to pick them at. Uh, I've seen people do that in the garden. That's that's more time and work than I'm willing to put in. Okay. Well, I, I, that answered several questions. <laughs> I appreciate All right. it. All right. We, you have a good weekend in the garden. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, sir. All right. Our phone number, 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at garden success at tamu. Dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh, I was looking at the National Gardening Bureau the other day and the National Gardening Bureau is uh, a group that um, really in many ways promotes gardening across the country uh, and they're the ones that have the year of designation uh, there, there's the year of a certain vegetable or the year of a certain flower, like a perennial. Uh, they have the uh, All America selections uh, as well. Uh, plants that have been tested all over the country. And uh, let's say it's a new variety of tomatoes, since we were talking about tomatoes. Uh, they've been tested all over the country, and some of them win nationally, meaning pretty much everywhere you plant them, they do really, really well. They excel. Others are regional winners, which makes sense. You know, maybe a, there's a tomato that does well in the south, but isn't so good up in the Midwest or the East or West Coast. And uh, so you can see all those winners on there, too. But I'm always curious about the year of. And, and this year, 2022, is the year of salad greens. <laughs> salad greens are, uh, that is one, uh, two words for a million different things. Uh, for When I grew up, salads were iceberg lettuce chunks, white gnarly I would say tasteless, but um, just iceberg lettuce. And then you threw on the standards. You threw on a chunk of tomato, a chunk of uh, cucumber, a few bacon bits, and a, a crouton. And then that was that was called a salad. And by the way, those salad bowls, 
in the in these restaurants were sitting on top of a bed of ice that was covered with kale. So you had this beautiful kale like like a carpet underneath everything and then the bowls of lettuce. And as I became a horticulturist, I, I was humored by the thought that what we should have been doing is eating the kale off the top of the ice and throwing the lettuce <laughs> onto the ice to be the greenery underneath, if health was a concern. Now I realize some of you are thinking, yeah, fresh kale, mm, that may be a little too much for, for me uh, as as the basis of a salad. But, but uh, you know, joking aside, uh, there are a lot of different greens that we can grow in addition to lettuce. I found that the head types of lettuce, like iceberg lettuce, don't do as well for us. We just have trouble getting really good uh, head development and good yield and production out of those. Now, you can, and some people probably listening or thinking, yeah, I can do it. But in general, if you want success with lettuce, I would grow a bib type lettuce or a leaf type lettuce or even a romaine type lettuce, the big upright, you know, the Caesar salad lettuce. Uh, so the, the romaine types do really well here. I did a trial one year of a dozen different romaine types. Every one of them did well. And, and so they they were all recommendable in my opinion. Uh, they did well. And they come in many kinds. You know, lettuce has the standard green, but it's got some that are freckled with burgundy or some that are almost all burgundy and, and a lot of different shapes of leaves and things like that to add interest to a salad. But the thing that makes the salad, the year of the salad greens interesting is because it allows us to talk about the, um, the value of all the greens mixed together uh, into a salad. And uh, I, I know that um, uh, you're familiar, of course, with lettuce, but are you familiar with things like chicory, for example? Chicory, uh, th that would be, that would include like endive and radicchio, uh, maybe a very bitter flavor, but in small amounts, that bitter flavor profile is very good in the greens. People talk about eating dandelion greens. Again, sometimes you can get a little bit of a bitterness in the flavor there. That's nice as part of a mix. Um, the um, the amaranth family uh, includes spinach, which of course is also probably spinach is the the one that we are also familiar with as one of our salad fresh salad vegetables. Uh, and from baby leaf spinach to the full size leaves, uh, they they do well. Arugula is another one in that family, also called rocket or roquette. Uh, arugula has a very uh, spicy flavor to the leaf kind of a nutty flavor as it gets older and the, when the heat it heats up it gets a much stronger flavor but uh, a little bit of arugula is good and then kale a little bit of kale mixed in uh, can be good and then finally mustard greens oh my gosh there's so many types of mustard greens now so going beyond those then we have our Asian greens of many many types uh, I'm probably growing six different ones in the garden this year, uh, three of which I've never grown before. Uh, but if you want an easy green to grow, I would try bok choy or pak choy. It is, it's just, it's fast and it's easy and it's unique in the way that it looks. And uh, it's in the, it's in that family of cruciferous vegetables. And so you, you know that it's in the cabbage group because there's a little bit of that flavor to it, but uh, it, it's fast, uh, like 28 days. And you, some of those uh, cultivars, you can, you can have bok choy ready to go. Swiss chard, very, very good one to grow here. Does super well. Uh, we now have colorful types of chard that we can grow. And then there's a lot of herbs that are kind of leafy. So something like basil or something like dill, for example, uh, would be, exa or cilantro, of course, uh, would be one that could be sprinkled into a salad to add flavoring. And then there's the, the tops of some of our greens, like beets and turnips, for example, are, are sometimes used. I would say turnips probably more as a cooked green. Uh, and beets basically are just uh, Swiss chard. Uh, they, they are so closely related. Uh, beets and Swiss chard, I almost would consider them interchangeable. So those are just a few of the things that you can put out there when summertime comes. Uh, all of these cool season things start to struggle and we look for other greens in our gardens. Some for salad uh, inclusion, but also some just for cooking. 
Uh, Molokia is, a, is a, a green that's very popular in many parts of the world, including the Mideast and, and other areas. Uh, that's very, very popular. And boy, does it ever grow here. I mean, it, it just thinks it's at home in our hot, humid climate. Uh, it does does super well. Um, Malabar. Malabar sometimes is called Malabar spinach. Uh, I don't know why we have to attach the word spinach to everything. We don't know what to, what to call. Uh, but it it's not a spinach at all, but it is it is a green that does well in the heat. Uh, there is some celosias that are used and some amaranth that are used. Uh, for those of you out on a farm, you probably know amaranth is pigweed, and, and it is. Uh, uh, but there are many types of amaranth, and some make big, large, very edible greens or, or leaves that are, that are good to eat. Um, another one that, I, that I'm growing again this year, and I, I, I do off and on, is, uh, let's see, purslane. Uh, purslane is also a weed that you see around. And purslane, though, uh, can be purchased as a specific variety. There's one called Gold Gelber and one called Red Gruner that are uh, purslane varieties. Purslane is a succulent. If you think about the purslane hanging baskets that you have in the summer with all the flowers, that's the kind of plant we're talking about. But rather than varieties that have big, beautiful blooms, these blooms are kind of smaller and a little less conspicuous, for sure. Uh, but these are varieties we grow to eat. And they have real high content of some of the omega fatty acids. They have kind of a tangy, lemony flavor to them. And you can grow them in a garden or in a container uh, to use uh, in various ways. Some people mix them in to egg dishes. Some people just in throw them in on salads. Uh, but as you can see, there, there's, a, there's a lot of greens out there that we could be talking about. And I'm going to stop and go to the phones and then come back and talk a little bit more about greens because I'd like to talk you into giving some of these a try. Let's see, our phone number, 845-5689, and we're going to talk to John. Hello, John. It's me again, and I, you made me think of something. I, uh -oh. I have found that uh, there's, there's almost nothing that's green that I grow that I can't eat. I mean, the <laughs> Brussels sprouts leaves, the, yes. the, 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 the collard, of course, the collard leaves, but, but yes. the, almost every plant that has big leaves or any kind of leaves, you know, but mostly the bigger ones, you can cook and eat it, <laughs> and they're very tasty. Well, I don't know how far I would take that one, but I know what you're saying is true. I found out, I think it was in the last two years, someone talked to me about eating carrot tops. And I thought, my goodness, is that for real? And sure enough, they're edible. Now, uh, as far as palatable and what they call mouthfeel, I don't know it, that carrot is, is going to push anybody else off the table for a spot. Uh, but there are a lot of things that as you get to looking at them, they're edible. Even, even of course, even the cabbage leaves, I mean, of the plant before it heads, yes. are, are very tasty. I, I, we, we really have started... Not throwing anything away. <laughs> yeah, well, at all. Yeah, you know, you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Good point. I a uh, friend of mine who was a gardener years ago, uh, one year bought a bunch of uh, collards, and I, I think it was collards. And as they were growing, he was picking the leaves, noticing they didn't look right. And all of a sudden, they started producing broccoli heads. And basically, he had somehow gotten broccoli and was just <laughs> eating the leaves off of it. So it, it's true. Those cruciferous crops are all related. They're basically all from the same kind of plant uh, that just people have selected them for, uh, you know, some like collards and, oh, and wow. uh, uh, kale. They they are selected for better leaves, and some of them like broccoli and, and cauliflower for their bloom heads. Some of them like kohlrabi because they have big, big swollen edible stems, uh, and on and on. Well, you're right. I mean, and 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 actually, the texture and the taste is, is quite good. I, I I haven't really found any that uh, were objectionable. All right. Well, uh, you know, you can. I guess what you're saying is you can eat anything that's in your garden. Just about. And I just have to throw out, oh yeah, that's true. I just have to throw out there that that would include deer. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm going to leave I'm gonna leave that one. Maybe it'll make the phone ring. <laughs> you, you keep bringing that up, but there are some very strong feelings one way or the other about that. I you? know, I know. I'm playing devil's advocate on that Listen, one. Listen, if, if uh, believe me, if, if things come to certain things, there will be deer eating here, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Well, I tell you, it's a it, it, gardening is fun and it's good. It's good for us. And you know, I was joking about uh, the salad bars when I was growing up being so incredibly boring. Uh, when you start mixing in, let's say five or six different species of edible leaf vegetables into a salad, you're you're changing the nutrient profile, the vitamins, the um, the bioactive substances that fight cancer that you know do all the different things that that plants can do uh, and i think you're making not only a, a more interesting salad but a healthier salad i did a, i believe that 100 percent now yeah we uh one time we were uh, just discussing a group of horticulturists and i were just discussing some of the plants and and the different things that are out there and another advantage uh, course we know now that our our diet is one of the number one reasons for some of the most significant health problems that we have in our country and uh, i grew up again slathering everything in uh, ranch dressing or whatever uh, to give it to give that iceberg flavor uh, when you start mixing in some of these greens you're adding flavors and now i just maybe a little light spray of olive oil here and there and and i'm good to go yep you're right all right. All right. Thank you. Thanks for calling back, John. I appreciate that. Our number is 845-5689, 845-5689. Uh, talking about greens, I, I just, as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm thinking of more greens to talk about. Uh, there is a green called sorrel, S-O-R-E-L, or is it two R's, two R's E-L. Anyway, sorrel greens have a lemony flavor. And there's one that has uh, little red veins in the green leaf. It's really pretty uh, to grow. I'm growing just a regular green type of sorrel, another, you know, lemony add to the salad. Uh, there's plantain. There's one called buckhorn plantain uh, that is, is edible, that can be grown. I've, I've tried growing that, and it, it, does, it does well. There's something called mosh, M-A-C-H-E, also called corn salad, that's a cool season green uh, that you can grow. So I guess I, I hope that you'll try some of these out. Maybe as the weather heats up, I'll go into a little bit more of the greens of summer, uh, and you can we can we can talk about those. Uh, generally, when we have a list of greens, what we're talking about is cool season vegetables. But as we're saying today, that doesn't have to be that way. Our phone number is eight four five five six eight nine. Let's go back to the phones now and talk to Nikki. Hello, Nikki. Hi. How are you? I'm well, thank you. What's up? I've got two, well, I've got two questions for you. Okay. The first one is I have two Meyer lemon trees in a bed by my house. Mm -hmm. And we do protect them in the winter and all, and they do really well normally. But last year they got like black sooty mold and white fly. Mm -hmm. And I waited too long to treat them, but I've done it with um, insecticidal soap and then the Garden Safe Fungicide 3. Okay. What can I do that's, I, I also picked up the bio-advanced fruit, citrus, and vegetable insect control. Okay. I don't know what I really need to do, though. I, it would take me a minute to look up the ingredients. That Garden Safe Fungicide 3, I'm, I'm going to guess, is probably an oil. Um, I, I don't, do, do you happen to have, do you happen to have any of those around, around you where you could pull them up and uh, take a look? Yeah, I'm, See if I, I, I can pull it up here in just a second, but um, uh, depending on what's in them, they may they may work. Yeah, it's it's neem oil. Garden Safe Fungicide Three is neem oil, uh, and so okay. so with that, you're going to have to get it on the the leaves with a good coating of all the leaf surfaces in order for it to protect. Or it it'll even kill it kills powdery mildew, mm -hmm. which is not an issue with your citrus, but uh, even after it's growing, um, I, I think. With the sooty mold, I, I would make sure you identify any and all the insects that may be involved. It could be scale. That's really likely on a citrus plant. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be white flies. can be mealybugs. There's a, and the aphids will, will do that uh, on plants. Uh, but so once you know exactly what you're going after, then picking the best product would work. So for aphids, for example, uh, a neem oil or a uh, uh, sexicidal soap that you've been using, they're really good. For the scale, the, the soap only works when the scale are in their little crawler stage. In other words, all the baby scale are running out to find new places to honker down on the leaf. That's, the soap will work on that, but not on the, the existing scale uh, very, very well. 
So uh, there are some systemics that will go through there and attack the scale. Most of the time people, when it's a crop you're going to grow, they're not real crazy about putting an insecticide in the plumbing of the plant. Uh, mm -hmm. and so I can understand staying away from that. Uh, but using a summer oil or a neem oil as a contact spray underneath the leaves where you probably, is, that's the most important part and around the little tender stems as well. Uh, most of the scale are going to be either on the leaves or on the, the branches, the younger branches of the plant. The white fly pupa are, are, are all going to be underneath the leaves. Uh, uh, spider mites, if they get on any of your plants, are under the leaves. And so uh, make sure your treatments are blown upward from underneath to coat the bottoms of the leaves. And I think you can get ahead of it. And all these things have natural enemies. So um, the, l the less we do to disrupt that, the, the better off we're going to be. If you go in with something that just kills everything, uh, it tends to really knock out all of the, the we'll say, good guys as well. Uh, then we tend to have kind of a, an outbreak, almost like a boomerang effect. Okay. So if you, if you can take a leaf or two uh, and take a picture of it or put it in a Ziploc bag, bring it to the extension office, let's take a look at it and make sure that what is on it is, is what we're going after with the products you already have. Or if, do we need to make a, a shift and try, try a different product? Okay. All right. Um, I have a second question too. Yeah. That so over a year ago, I bought some corners to make res, raised garden beds. Yes. You're simply supposed to choose your lumber and slide it in. Okay. Yes. And I, I picked three foot tall ones, thinking that they would be a nice divider in the yard too. Mm -hmm. And my husband's been very reluctant to help me put them together. He thinks they're going to be too big and too dense for the soil. So what should I fill them with, and is there something I can put in the bottom to take up space? So you're talking about those, it's, it's kind of like a, a block material that the boards slide into? Right. Okay. And you you shouldn't need to go more than, you know, maybe 12 inches high with those in terms of the soil for the plant. The negative of going higher, I don't know how stable those are as you get up, you know, three or four blocks high, like I think you're describing. Um, th stability might concern me just a little bit because they do hold the boards, but they're not made to be a retaining wall. And, and so uh, I would be a little concerned about that. The other thing is you, s you spend a lot of money on soil to fill those things up when you go deeper and <laughs> deeper and deeper than it needs to be. So that would be the other the other issue. Plus, all that soil is going to sink down. You know, if you have one foot deep, it may sink down to 10 or 8 inches, let's say. But if it's three feet deep, it's going to sink down to two feet deep and, and not too long of a time. And so then you're adding a whole other foot in there trying to, to get it back up to the level. So... Um, I think I wouldn't get too deep with those. The problem is, I think what I have is slightly different. Okay. It's metal sides that the boards slide in. So oh, unless okay. I bury part of it in the ground, it's fixed in height. Okay. Oh, boy, I'm trying to picture what you have. If you could send me an email with a photo, that would be easier. Uh, those kind of beds do get taller. And uh, I, I guess... I wouldn't worry about, I think you mentioned the concern being like squishing down the soil in there. How, how was that worded? Oh, well, he was more worried about stability than squishing. Okay. And that there was so much soil that would have to go in there. And yeah. so, yeah. Well, I mean, I've heard about putting plastic jugs in the bottom and such, but it seems right. like they would compress. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a way to do that, but that's a lot of jugs. Um so yeah. if, you, if you have any kind of a plastic container that you can seal, that air, it, it can take quite a bit of weight uh, on it. And people will, in a deep bed, often put stuff like that in the bottom and then put a board or a layer, and a layer of fabric, uh, ground fabric, to create a false floor for the bed ah. that goes above that. And so you could certainly do that, or you could just put it on some sort of, 
kind of stilts underneath there. And I don't know, there's about a thousand ways to, to create something, including sections of uh, livestock panels that are very rigid and strong that have a fabric above them, you know, to, to mm -hmm. hold. Uh, I, that that becomes an engineering question, and so I would just say if you can engineer it in a way that seems to work, that's good. But if you get above the ground, the roots can't go in the ground, and so you definitely are going to need to have uh, 12 to 16 inches of soil in that bed uh, wherever you create the false floor above that. Okay. All right. That helps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Let's go to the phones and talk to Marion. Hello, Marion. Hello, Skip. Thanks, thanks for the shout out on the Herb Society's uh, plant sale. But okay. One, one of the salad greens that was new to me three or four years ago from that sale mm -hmm. was leaf, leaf celery. Okay. Because yes. we can't grow the, the bulb kind like you get in the grocery store. Yes. But, but yeah. the leaf celery does really well, in at least where I am in Burleson County. It does and, well. Uh, and after it gets you know, a certain age, then you get little skinny ribs mm -hmm. and uh, you can chop that up like you do regular grocery store celery. But the little celery leaves are wonderful in salad. They are wonderful and they're strong. They are much stronger than regular celery in terms and, of that flavor. Oh, yeah. It doesn't take very much. No. But it, it is like zero work to grow. So I think more people should grow that. And a lot of people have never heard of it. That's a great one. And since you're talking Herb Society and stuff, I think Salad Burnett is one that I probably should have put on the list as well that has a cucumber, oh, cucumbery flavor. Yes. Yeah, we could do a whole could, show I just on all leafy. kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for mentioning. I'd forgotten. Sometimes the leaf celery is called Chinese celery in catalogs, but it's a Instead of thinking, for those listening, instead of thinking about the long, deeply ribbed um, uh, celery stalks, like you would think of when someone says the word celery, these are, are more skinny petioles. They do have a groove in them, but it, it's, a, it's a smaller petiole and a little mounding bush. In fact, one bush, unless you're doing a lot of cooking, is probably enough. Well, making a lot of chicken salad. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you, Marion, for that call. Was there something else you called about or just to kind of fill us in on those? No, I just did. Those were two that got left out. All right. Well, I'm sure thank I've you. left I've left more. But thanks for filling us in. I appreciate that a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Let's now go to the phones and talk to Roger. Hello, Roger. Hello, Skip. How are you doing? I'm, I'm well, <laughs> thank you. Um, I got a compliment for you and a question. OK. <laughs> The compliment is your advice to uh, put in my bed's uh, newspaper and then cover it up with uh, mulch. Yes. Fantastic results. It's just gr great. It's ready to go in, uh, this spring. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And as long as you keep the soil covered, uh, you're going you're gonna to have a lot less weeding problems. Well, that, that, I'm sure hope so. Yeah, it gives it gives a gardener time to get into all kinds of trouble in the summer that would other be, otherwise be spent weeding. Okay, I'll, I'll probably get into trouble. My question is, I, a couple of years ago, I bought this um, evergreen vine uh, for my arbor. I have a, kind of a metal arbor out in the yard, and it was called, it's called Fandango Coral Vine. And uh, one, one side has been growing just really nice, and the other side unfortunately died. I'd like to replace it. Uh, replace the one that died with the same thing or something very similar. I've had no luck uh, going to several different uh, uh, stores here in town to try to find it again. Yeah, uh, coral vine you should be able to find, but Fandango, I don't know if that is a variety or if that is just another name for the coral vine. I wasn't aware of a variety named that, so... Um, well, just like the gardeners to some of these places, they, they, they said the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm i going to give it a guess uh, up front, I'm guessing. I think Fandango may just be another name for red coral vine. Uh, so uh, let's see. If you cannot find it locally, you might try a place uh, further out. Some of, the, some of the garden centers further out, you know, um, gosh, what's the... Uh, um, Arborgate, for example, is probably going to carry something like that. Uh, you might call up to a place like uh, Bobo's up in, Hutt in uh, 
Buffalo area. These are all drives, but uh, drives worth doing. Uh, mm. And and you may you may try to find it in a place like that. I but I would also talk to our local folks and say, can you get it? And maybe they could order it in for you. That is a it loves hot weather. It's essentially acting like a sweet potato. It's closely related. And uh, so if you didn't get it for another month, that'd be okay. It would hit the ground running and do just fine. Okay, well, it did before, so I'm sure looking forward to it again. So ask for red coral vine. Yeah, red coral vine. Uh, the um, uh, Let's see. what. Oh, gosh. Antigonon, A-N-T-I-G-O-N-O-N, Leptopus, I believe, is the is the proper name. But you have to be careful with some of these vines and names. You know, if it's called a butterfly vine or uh, sometimes different things get named the same thing. But this is a coral vine. Coral vine is the real name. It's a, it comes from an underground sweet potato-like storage structure. And it is, uh, yeah, Antig- Antigonon, like anti-G-O-N-O-N uh, is, the, is the genus. And uh, it dies back to the ground, but boy, I tell you, when it gets growing, you watch out. I've seen it go up a windmill. <laughs> so. uh, it, it'll really go up, and it doesn't in the winter time. It just uh, it gets a little, uh, you know, scraggly looking, mm-hmm. but it's already coming back this spring. Yep, it it's an enthusiastic grower. So just have it on something where it can't reach out about three feet and grab something else because it'll <laughs> take off. I, I have seen it go across a chain link fence. Somehow grab onto a pole, go up to electric line, and head down the line like it was heading down the street, like a, like a uh, a toddler at first day of uh, kindergarten. <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of plants I like. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well your your neighbors are just going to want to be you to be stationed at the border between the properties. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see about that. Okay. All right. You. Thank you, Roger. You betcha. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Oh, my goodness. What were we talking about before we started talking on the phones? Uh, let's see. We've, we've we're talking about different plants and plants. Oh, Sally Greens. Okay. I think we've probably covered that one enough for now. We'll come back to that topic at another time. Uh, it is, it is uh, the beautiful weather that makes everybody wants to go out, go out and garden. And so please do that. Uh, article in the, in the um, state, or statesman. Oh, my gosh. I'm two jobs ago. Uh, article in the uh, Bryan College Station Eagle, the Eagle newspaper this Friday, uh, have on brown thumbs. So if you think you have a brown thumb, and when you try to grow stuff, it dies. When other people grow, do it, it doesn't. Well, read the article. Uh, there is hope for brown thumbs, and you uh, absolutely can grow things just with a little good information. Lots of good classes going on uh, in an ongoing basis around the community uh, for you to learn more and to visit. You can visit with some of our master gardeners partners with AgriLife Extension, uh, gain from their knowledge and experience as well. Uh, but there's a lot to be doing. We're, we're now getting toward, you know, the mid part of March. And so all those warm season crops like green beans and corn and cucumbers and tomatoes and melons and and uh, 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 even peppers uh, here, uh, the, the squash, uh, just lots of good things we can be planting out in the garden this time of year. If you want a vegetable planting guide or a, a kind of a calendar, a chart that tells you when to plant what, go to brazosmg.com and click into the edible section and you'll find the vegetable planting chart there. It's green. You know you found it when you see a green chart. Uh, and it tells you exactly when to plant all kinds of things uh, here in this area. We also have listed on there our average first and last freeze dates of the year. Uh, that's average, so you can do with that uh, as you wish. Uh, but uh, vegetable gardening is just fun. You know, I ordered a bunch of new containers. Now, I have room for a garden, and I enjoy filling my garden with stuff. But I also garden in containers. I just ordered 10 new containers to try out some of these new dwarf uh, tomatoes that I was talking with John about earlier. Uh, the um, it, it, containers are a great way to garden. And if you don't, you know, let's say you want to garden, but it you don't want to rent a rototiller and go out in the yard and make a spot. Well, try a container first. Uh, get a container that's at least five gallons in size for most of the things we're growing. If you're going to grow a tomato, at least 10 gallons. Uh, but get out there and have fun. Take the kids with you. And we'll look forward to talking to you again next Thursday.
You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209.